take a small little detour away from all the numbers uh, for a minute and introduce something called the balanced scorecard. And this is not something new. Um, I believe it first appeared, uh, well, I know it first appeared in a Harvard Business Review article. I'm going to guess early 90s. Uh, is when it uh, uh, first appeared. I believe one of the authors was Kaplan. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. Anyways, uh, not a history lesson here, but to introduce the, the concept of what a balanced scorecard is, and you may be wondering why are we introducing it in an accounting textbook, a management accounting textbook, well, it's because we are so focused, and throughout this entire course, we've been so focused on the numbers. And this chapter is about measuring and controlling performance, mostly measuring performance. And we've been looking at it from a financial perspective. But if we look at the screen here and we see under performance measures, let's just forget about everything else for now. We'll, we'll get to that. But look under performance measures. We have four of them. The first one is financial. But financial indicators are lagging indicators. We wait for the month to be over, then we develop our reports. We look at our variances from budget. And we see what has happened, but we do not see what will happen. We can make budgets to uh, uh, assume what will happen or our best guess as to what will happen. But when we do the reports, we really are looking at lagging indicators. And here's the trap. Uh, accounting data is easy to measure. And it's accurate because we know what we've spent, so it's easy to measure and it's accurate. So we fall into the trap that thinking it's extremely valuable uh, because of these features. And I don't want to detract from the numbers at all. They are extremely valuable. But the idea that was being presented in this balanced scorecard was that, listen, companies follow uh, some pretty broad strategies. In fact, you could probably take most companies and, and classify them into th these three different categories. Some follow cost leadership like a Walmart. Some follow differentiation. That's a good example would be Apple right there. Some has a, a follow a focus or a niche product. You can almost say that uh, uh, Blackberry at this point is a niche product. Uh, Crocs, for instance, is, uh, sells just a funny looking type of shoe. Uh, that would be a focus or a niche uh, strategy. And it's the strategy that should drive the performance measure. So if we're following, even in financial indicators really, if you have a, a company following a cost leadership strategy, our performance measures really should be heavy on the cost side. We should be looking at squeezing costs out of the system. Whereas if we're looking at a differentiation strategy, our financial measures should be more more targeted towards the type of margin we're achieving. Because if we're following a differentiation strategy, we should be able to command a premium price for our product. And if our margins aren't representing that, then clearly that's not what we're doing. The results are not suggesting that we have a differentiation strategy. Well, turns out, uh, as most things turn out, that the financial indicators and the financial performance measures being lagging are really just one element of things. These are the results. These are the effects. And it's the effect of what we do in the other areas. And there are four categories. Uh, at the bottom we have learning and growth. Uh, this is uh, about training uh, and the uh, human assets in the organization becoming better and better at what they do. We have internal businesses, business processes, and this is our manufacturing facility or whatever it is that we do, whether we're a service uh, business, a merchandising business, but how we get from A to B, how we get the stuff in the back door and out the front door, whatever the stuff is. The customer, how does the customer get treated? How does the customer feel? What are the trends in customer service? These are all leading indicators and they can influence the behavior of the organization if we, if we can measure them. So the question then becomes, well, with learning and growth, how would we measure that? Internal businesses process, how would we measure improvement? Customer service, how would we measure improvement? So the goal here, you've noticed that I said it three times, the goal is to always improve. We're looking for improvement. 
will improving learning and growth improve our internal business processes? Will improving that in turn improve our customer relations, our customer service? And will that in turn improve our financial measures? So I'm going to wait till the next screen before I really show you how these things operate together. But between the strategy and the performance measures, there must be consistency. If your organization, or if the organization of which you'll be hired in, is following a differentiation strategy, the uh, measurements you take in learning and growth, or what you seek to measure, to measure performance, must be consistent with that strategy. So if there is a differentiation strategy and we're spending and you feel that an organization is spending money on human development, human development but uh, uh, human asset development, you can't suddenly say, wait a minute, that's costing a lot of money. That doesn't make a lot of sense. We're spending too much money over here. We're spending too much because it's consistent with improvement throughout the system. So you can't follow a differentiation strategy, but measure performance as if you were trying to run the lowest cost business that you can. So they must be consistent and they must be relevant. And also, here's the thing. And, uh, you know, anybody who's made New Year's resolutions know that this is entirely true. Not too many. Not too many at all. In fact, there's research that shows that if you're developing uh, um, goals... Uh, let's say, uh, in re call them resolutions or whatever, and you develop maybe two or three goals, you'll probably get them all. But if you start developing goals in the numbers of six to eight, uh, you might get one or two. One or two might happen. But if you have ten or more goals, uh, you're going to achieve none of them. And now, this is not me just saying this. This is plenty of research that shows, listen, when, when organizations and individuals limit themselves to three main goals, two or three main goals, they have a very clear focus. They'll probably achieve all of them. Once they start getting to six and eight, you can't pay attention to six to eight things. You just simply can't. And then 10 plus is just ridiculous. So if you have a New Year's resolution list because you're developing a balanced scorecard for yourself, let's say, and you have like 10 plus things that you're going to try to change about yourself, none of them are going to work out. You'll probably fail on all of them. So that's why whatever you're measuring, not too many of them. You don't, too many metrics, there's too many things to measure. It doesn't make sense. Pick the big ones. Make sure they're easily understood, that everybody understands what they are. If you're going to lose weight, right, there are two things you can do to lose weight, and it's easily understood. You can uh, uh, spend more calories. Spending calories means uh, every time you do something, you're spending calories. You can spend more calories, and you can consume fewer calories. There you go. So basically, you have two measurements. Your goal is to spend more calories, and your goal is to consume fewer calories. If you set those as your two goals and focus on those things, there you go. You'll probably lose weight. But once you start saying, well, I'm going to do this and that and this, and I'm going to change this and change that, change my whole diet, I'm going to start doing this and that, you probably fail at all of them because that's way too much, and it's way too much to measure. This is nice and simple, right? So let's have a look at uh, at this in just a little bit more detail to see how how this integrates together, and then uh, and then I'll stop there because I don't want to turn this into a, a three hour uh, uh, lecture on what a balanced scorecard is. Number one, that's not what we're doing in this course, and number two. There's uh, 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 plenty of better resources on YouTube. If you really want to get into the balance scorecard into detail, uh, there's plenty of better resources than I can do. Okay, so let's just go through a, a really mini example here. I've got the four categories uh, uh, down the side of which we're going to develop performance measures for. Our financial, the customer, internal processes, and learning and growth. And you'll notice across both of them, we're going to stick with either two or three. Nothing more than that, just two or three. Now, how do we go about drawing this out? Well, if we start from the bottom, we ask if-then questions. 
If we start from the top, we ask how. So let's start from the top and work our way down. And then we'll start from the bottom and work our way up to see how this works. For our financial uh, performance measurements, the big one is increased profitability. That should be every organization's uh, uh, financial goal, increased profitability. How? Notice the question, how? How do we increase profitability? Well, we can lower our costs or we can increase our revenues. So there we go. We've got our three big uh, measurements for financial. We, we're going to increase profitability. We're going to lower our cost, increase revenue. We can measure that. That's easily understood. Okay, so increase revenue. How? Well, the best way to do it is improve customer retention. Either get more customers or get more out of the customers that you have right now. The easiest way to increase revenue is to improve customer retention so we don't lose customers. They're the cheapest ones to keep. It costs more money to get a new customer than it does to keep a customer. And we can go for market share or we can go for wallet share. Wallet share means for every customer you have, you get a bigger and bigger share of their purchases. So improved customer retention will increase revenue. So that's how we increase revenue is by improving customer retention. Well, how? Notice I keep asking how. Well, we can lower the wait time for whatever it is. Maybe it's a wait for service. Maybe it's a wait for a product. Maybe it's a, what they wait on the phone or whatever the case is. We find that uh, it could be a bank and the amount of time that they stand in line. Uh, we don't like that idea. It could be a, a cable company and the amount of time they sit at home waiting for service or waiting for repair, whatever the case is. But we can measure wait time. You can measure that. It's measurable. Well, how do we lower wait time? Well, we can reduce the cycle time, the time it takes internally to do something. Well, how do we reduce that? Well, we can increase our process efficiency. Well, how do we increase our process efficiency? We can improve the knowledge and skills of our workers, better trained workers, or we can improve the tools and technology they work with. Better equipment, better technology, better communication technology. Rather than sitting, have a customer sit at home from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock waiting for the cable person to come by, we can, the, 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 the cable company can say, well, let's give all of our reps a, a phone and a phone number and they'll call ahead half an hour before they're expected to be there. So wherever the individual is, they can head home at that time and meet them rather than sitting and wasting five hours. That's power, right? Well, lower cost. How do we lower cost? Well, we can improve our process efficiency. How do we do that? We've already settled that. So by increasing our process efficiency, notice it directly can lower our cost and we have a bunch of other routes. So that's how. Let's see if it holds together if we ask if then. If we improve our knowledge and skills, then it'll increase process efficiency. Notice that that is a hypothesis. We don't know that. If we improve knowledge and skills, it then it should increase process efficiency. So once we make that statement, we can apply the improvement in knowledge and skills and see if it does have the effect. If it doesn't, don't do it. Say, okay, well, that did that's not going to work. Let's try something else to improve process efficiency. So if we improve knowledge and skills, then it increases process efficiency. If we improve the tools and technology our employees have to work with, then it increases process efficiency. So you can measure what that means. You can measure this and you can measure this. Notice that these are non-accounting things, but they can still be measured. Here, go, here we go again. If we increase process efficiency, then we can reduce cycle time. If we can reduce cycle time, then we can lower the wait time for our customers. If we can lower the wait time for our customers, then we can improve customer retention. If we can improve customer retention, then we can increase revenue. If we increase revenue, then we can increase profitability. So it doesn't matter where you start. If you start at the top and you say, I want to increase profitability, the logical question is, well, how am I going to do that? And there's two ways to do it, lower my costs or increase revenues. So keep in mind, all you're going to do now on the same level is just talk about the financial goals that you can reach to increase profitability. These are the two. Then we're going to go down one level to the customer and say, well, the customer is the one who gives me the money. So how do I get them to give me more money? 
They're not the ones who lower my cost. Notice we went right over the customer here because they're not the ones who lower the cost. They're the ones who give me money. So they increase revenue, which leads to increased profitability. But internal processes will lower cost, but will also create something that satisfies the customer. Now, this doesn't have to be wait time. We can improve our process efficiency to uh, reduce defects. And we can measure that. We increase our process efficiency, we can reduce defects. Reducing defects, notice like this, can improve customer retention right away. We don't have to go through this one. So we might only have one measure on this one. So we can reduce cycle time. We can also reduce defects. Reduce cycle time, lower wait time, improve customer retention. Reduce defects, right to customer retention as well. So there's three on this side. The thing, you don't want to start saying, well, reduce defects, do this, do this, do this. You don't want to have 15 or 12 running across here. You don't want to have any of that. Two to three, maybe four if it's really critical and you say, look, I, I, I can't see how I get rid of the fourth one. Then fine, but then stop. Please stop at that point, right? So there we go. I think that, uh, that that should cover the balance scorecard. The idea behind this for all you bean counters out there and all you management accountants and those pursuing a career in, in, in this is that don't let the numbers be the end all and be all for you. You're not just there to count. Remember in chapter one, when we first started this process, I said that management accounting more than any other type of accounting for an organization you learn how to create value. And I said, that's power, if you can create value. Well, this helps you create value at the deepest levels of the organization that are non-accounting. You can suggest that, that, that implementations of this at the learning and growth stage will affect the processes which will affect the customer, which will affect costs and revenues. And that's what a management accountant is there for, is to tell the organization, listen, here's how we can improve ourselves. Well, don't just improve yourself by looking at numbers. Look at what causes the numbers to happen. That's in your realm. So that's as far as I'm going to go on balance scorecard. I hope that helped.